Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In the quiet town of Hexham, England, an innocent backyard discovery would soon spiral into one of the most bizarre and enduring mysteries of the 20th century. When two young boys unearthed a pair of small stone heads in their garden in the early 1970s, they unknowingly set in motion a chain of events that would captivate archaeologists, paranormal investigators, and the public alike. The seemingly innocuous objects, known as the Hexham Heads, would become the center of a whirlwind of controversy, blending archaeological intrigue with supernatural occurrences. As the heads changed hands from local museums to esteemed universities, they left a trail of inexplicable phenomena in their wake. Reports of poltergeist activity, sightings of a werewolf-like creature, and academic disputes over their origin and composition only deepened the mystery. Were these ancient Celtic artifacts imbued with a curse, or merely misidentified modern creations? The Hexham heads vanished as mysteriously as they appeared, leaving behind a legacy that continues to haunt the imaginations of those who remember their strange tale. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Deep within the ancient limestone caves of Wookie Hole, a legendary witch once cast her dark curse over the nearby village, dooming all love to fail. Centuries later, the echoes of her magic still haunt the caverns, where eerie sounds and ghostly figures continue to baffle and terrify visitors. Is the petrified figure in the witch's kitchen truly the stone remains of the cursed sorceress? Or does her spirit linger, waiting for someone to break the spell? In 1954, off the coast of Australia, a routine flight turned into one of the most compelling UFO encounters in history. When Royal Australian Navy pilot Lt. O'Farrell reported two mysterious lights outpacing his Sea Fury aircraft, he couldn't have imagined that his sighting, confirmed by multiple radar operators on the ground, would become a cornerstone case in UFO research for decades to come. But first, when two boys unearth strange stone heads in their backyard, they unknowingly trigger a series of eerie events, from ghostly encounters to bizarre werewolf sightings. As archaeologists and paranormal investigators examine the Hexham heads, rumors of ancient curses and supernatural forces grow. But are the objects truly cursed, or is it all just a legend? We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. Mobile urban prehistory, such as items that could be found in a garden and then placed on a mantelpiece, 
has either been discovered and removed or is too large and unwieldy, like a standing stone, to serve as a decoration, except in the most magnificent homes. When individuals come across potentially ancient objects, they usually bring them to a nearby museum for identification, where they eventually become lost in time, stored away or tucked in a forgotten corner. However, there is a notable exception to this trend. Archaeologists, a generally superstitious and curious group, often encounter stories of famous curses that are largely fueled by popular culture. One of the most well-known instances is the Curse of the Mummy, or Curse of the Pharaohs, which is part of a phenomenon referred to as Mummy Mania by Jasmine Day. This fascination dates back to the 19th century BC and is largely a creation of the Victorian era, as highlighted by John J. Johnston and others. Nevertheless, there is a peculiar logical inconsistency surrounding the idea of the Curse of Tutankhamun, which allegedly resulted in the deaths of several individuals, some of whom were elderly and others who succumbed to insect bites in hot, humid locales apart from armpits. Reports of a dog howling add to the mystique. These events unfolded over an extended period. Mummy curses are predominantly featured in popular culture, such as movies, books, and video games. However, these fictional tales are rooted in actual archaeological findings, though often unearthed in dubious colonial contexts, which include human remains, despite the fate of their internal organs and brains posthumously. Is there validity to the concept of a cursed archaeological discovery? Could ancient artifacts carry dormant malevolent forces sealed within the burial site only to be awakened upon their discovery? Curses are somewhat of a cliché in the field of archaeology and often spark light-hearted discussions during excavation projects. Rituals are sometimes performed prior to digs and ceremonies conducted as sites are covered up once more. These actions are driven by various reasons, although many don't take many of them seriously. Archaeologists frequently leave items behind at excavation sites to be interred alongside the remnants of the location, ranging from whiskey bottles to coins and other items best left unmentioned until they retire or pass away. These deliberate deposits mirror documented archaeological practices but they also serve as a gesture of recompense for what they have extracted. What about another, less renowned archaeological hex linked to the infamous Hexum Heads? Some individuals who interacted with and owned these items between 1971 and 1978 believed them to be cursed. In a typical garden in northern England, two boys from an ordinary family stumbled upon a pair of peculiar stone heads with eerie little faces. What started as a random and somewhat amusing discovery quickly grew into a chaotic situation. Soon enough, museums, archaeologists, geologists, the media, and various pseudoscientists were all vying to examine these mysterious objects. The heads were closely examined analyzed and transported to a different part of the country where they gained a reputation of being otherworldly and notorious. However, as time passed, interest in the heads dwindled and, under mysterious circumstances, they disappeared. It should be noted that along the way rumors began to circulate about a supposed werewolf-like creature haunting those who possessed the heads. The Hexum heads embody a form of urban prehistory that blurs the lines between the past and present, intriguingly reflecting the archaeological process of investigating newfound artifacts. The cautious and systematic approach taken by most scientists involved in studying the heads enhances this comparison. What makes this tale particularly unusual is its incorporation of elements often associated with archaeology, cursed relics, enigmatic objects, malevolent stones, and ancient rituals. The specific date and circumstances of the discovery are not crucial, as various published accounts differ on minor details such as the timing and manner in which the heads were uncovered. It could have been in 1971 or 1972 
when the two young boys stumbled upon the Hexham heads in their backyard at 3 Reed Avenue within the town of Hexham. The boys could have been engaged in weeding, clearing vegetation, or even digging in the ground. Regardless, they quickly unearthed one head each, creating a pleasing symmetry. These objects seemed to be crafted from stone, resembling a pair of somewhat eerie little figures. Both items were approximately spherical in shape, each featuring a protrusion from the neck that indicated they may have once been attached to another object, perhaps a small body or a pedestal. Those who have held the heads quite literally in their palms have provided varied and colorful descriptions of the objects. Accounts differ regarding the head's size depending on the information source, with descriptions ranging from the size of a tennis ball to that of a small tangerine. Facial descriptions of these miniature carved stone balls have mainly focused on the distinct gendered characteristics ascribed to them, along with certain assumptions derived from their facial expressions. In his meticulous yet somewhat digressive 2010 book, Quest for the Hexham Heads, Paul Screeton noted that one of the heads was referred to as the boy, characterized by hair fashioned in striped patterns from front to back. On the other hand, the second has received less favorable treatment in Hexham Heads literature, being labeled, depending on the source, as the girl, old woman, or hag, featuring wildly bulging eyes and, as described by Don Robbins, a strong beaked nose. It remains ambiguous whether the attribution of these negative traits linked to the female head predated or postdated the supernatural occurrences that were reportedly associated with the discovery of these objects. Events took a strange and uncanny turn while the objects were housed at the finder's home and that of their neighbors in the adjoining semi-detached residence. It was believed that the heads would mysteriously rotate during the night to face certain directions by morning, occurrences that under different circumstances might be associated with a poltergeist. One night, an eerie incident unfolded. A neighbor, Mrs. Dodds, woke to a peculiar visitor in her bedroom, a creature that was part sheep, part human. The hybrid being quietly made its way downstairs and out the front door upon being spotted. This was not the first time such a creature had been summoned by the heads, as we'll soon learn. As much as the image of a sheep transformed into a mysterious being roaming around Hexham in the early 1970s captivates the imagination, a more plausible explanation arises. Mentioned in a Fortean Times article from November 2012, Stuart Farrell recounted a local tale of a prank involving an intoxicated individual carrying a stolen sheep carcass on his back, taken from a neighbor's abattoir, shuffling up Reed Avenue on the same night. Irrespective of the events that transpired, the incidents surrounding the heads became a topic of local discussion and media coverage, with an air of mystique and peril surrounding them from that moment on frequently depicted in 1970s television and newspaper reports as malevolent. The heads were soon relocated, moved out of their residence, and submitted to Hexham Abbey for professional analysis, presumably not for exorcism. They were also temporarily housed at the Museum of Antiquities at Newcastle University and spent some time in Southampton as well. Over the following years, they underwent examination and testing by various experts, yet no definitive agreement was reached regarding their composition or their authenticity as ancient artifacts. Adding to the uncertainty was the emergence of another figure in the narrative, a local man named Des Craigie who previously resided at 3 Reed Avenue. During an interview with the Evening Chronicle, he disclosed a surprising revelation, stating that he was the creator of the heads. Craigie claimed, I crafted them approximately 16 years ago. I fashioned the heads using pieces of stone and mortar solely to entertain my daughter when she was young. I made three in total, but it seems one went missing. They were displayed in the garden for many years. I can confirm that I created them. I find it quite amusing that these heads have garnered such attention." He proceeded to craft a couple more heads to demonstrate his ability, using local stone, sand, and water, albeit with less impressive results compared to the originals. Indeed, a bombshell. It was even more surprising considering that archaeologists and academics 
had not foreseen the possibility that the heads were simply rather unsettling cement toys crafted in the late 1950s. Such are the dangers of urban prehistory. At times, the urban aspect overshadows the prehistoric nature. Craigie's public declaration of ownership over the Hexham heads posed a specific challenge for the archaeologist historian Anne Ross, who had prominently stated that the stones were most likely of Celtic Iron Age origin. This laid the groundwork for debates and deliberations regarding the material and significance of the heads, whether they were truly cursed, and if the were creature, as per some accounts, was indeed trailing the heads. Would the curse of the Hexham Heads follow them to their next destination, the Newcastle Museum of Antiquities? And what's the deal with this were creature? We'll find out when Weird Darkness returns. Hey, weirdos! Who are you? Oh, hey there, it's me, Darren Marlar. What are you doing here? I'm here to tell people about the next weirdo watch party. You don't remember me. <laughs> are you kidding? You're Bella Lugosi, you're a legend! That's why we're showing your film, Spooks Run Wild, on Friday, September 27th. We ain't waiting for nothing, we're going right now. Well, you can visit the page right now if you want to. The Monster Channel page does have horror movies and horror hosts 24 hours a day. Uh, but the movie I'm here to tell you about is just Friday night, September 27th. It's hosted by Horror Hotel's Lamia the Vampire. She's a vampire like Bella Lugosi. It says here that in the night he prowls about seeking new victims, and in the daytime he sleeps in a coffin. Well, let's wait till daytime. The East Side kids hear about a monster killer roaming the countryside, and when one of them gets shot... <laughs> uh, I don't think that's funny, but anyway... Uh, when one of them gets shot, they seek aid at an old mansion, and they run into Bella Lugosi. You scared the health out of me! Did you just say scared the health out of you? I haven't heard that one before. Anyway, the fun begins Friday night, September 27th at 7 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Mountain, 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch, so tune in at showtime, watch the movie with me and all the other Weirdo family members, and even join the chat during the film for more fun. We're always cracking jokes during the movies, and this is a horror comedy, so it'll be even more fun. <laughs> it's Lamia from Horror Hotel presenting Bella Lugosi in the horror comedy Spooks Run Wild, Friday night, September 27th. You can see a trailer for the film now and watch horror hosts and B-horror movies for free anytime on the Monster Channel page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash TV, and we'll see you Friday night, September 27th. subsequent to their unearthing, the heads were promptly handed over to the authorities. They were temporarily housed at the Newcastle Museum of Antiquities, where they were meticulously drawn to scale in a customary archaeological fashion, consequently transforming them into official archaeological relics. Archaeologists and curators such as Roger Mickett and David Smith, who came into contact with or knew of the heads, refrained from definitive statements about the true nature of these enigmatic objects. The extraordinary narrative surrounding the items and the purported curse failed to significantly impact these seasoned professionals, if they were even aware of such tales. Mickett, in Paul Screeton's 2010 publication Quest for the Hexham Heads, characterized them as mere archaeological material, akin to likening the Turin Shroud to simply a blanket. Prior to the revelation made by the local resident Des Craigie that he had crafted the objects as toys for his children in the 1950s, some individuals were not as cautious in their response. One academic in particular enthusiastically embraced the Hexham heads, situating them in a tradition of Romano-Celtic head worship. This daring interpretation led her to encounter a werewolf, reminiscent of past events on Reed Avenue. This academic was the late Dr. Anne Ross, a prominent scholar of Celtic studies 
who delved into archaeology, history, art history, folklore, and Celtic mysticism. Known for her notable works like The Pagan Celts and Pagan Celtic Britain, Ross had a mixed reception from early medieval archaeologists, admired for her work yet viewed as eccentric due to her unique interests. Ross became entangled in the Hexham Heads affair when she received images and sketches of the artifacts from Roger Mickett. During a lecture in Newcastle, she attracted attention by hinting and exploring the heads and discussing her encounter with Ware Sheep with Mrs. Dodds, a neighbor of the boys who discovered the heads in 1972. Intrigued by the mysterious objects and the odd events surrounding them, Ross speculated that they were ancient Celtic items, possibly cursed, and that the Garden of Three Reed Avenue, their place of discovery, could have been a Celtic sacred site. Although she entertained thoughts of excavating the garden, she never pursued the idea. Anne Ross's fascination with these peculiar small objects was not unexpected. Her research focus on the cult of the head across Celtic Europe had been long-standing. In a 1967 publication, she emphasized that the Celts revered the human head as a symbol of divinity and mystical powers. Pagan Celtic Britain, page 61. A newspaper expert from the Daily Telegraph discovered in a copy of Pagan Celtic Britain at the Leslie Alcock Library, University of Glasgow, mentioned a collection of carved stone heads found in Yorkshire. The archaeology correspondent F. W. Perfect highlighted their unearthing, noting that individuals had brought these crude, almost caricature-like human faces to a museum in Bradford after uncovering them in gardens and allotments. Some faces were described as grotesque with distinct, heavy mustaches, leading Anne Ross to speculate that some might be of Celtic origin. In a swift manner, she expedited the publication of the two stone heads in Volume 1 of the fifth series, 1973, of the journal Archaeologia Aeliana, within an article titled Some New Thoughts on Old Heads. This article discusses recently uncovered stone heads near Hadrian's Wall, all claiming to be of Romano-British origin. The heads, referred to as two small stone heads from Hexham, were both depicted and described in the publication. The author makes note of their archaic appearance without providing significant dating evidence, speculating that their find spot suggests an early date, despite being found in a back garden. Additionally, the article mentions the findings of visual and petrological analyses conducted by Professor Frank Hodson at Southampton University revealing that the heads were crafted from sandstone with traces of lime coating and color pigments. Although the inclusion of these disputed objects in an academic journal may seem peculiar, the author attempted to lend them archaeological credibility by associating them with other heads possessing better provenance and stronger claims to authenticity. The publication format aimed to strengthen this claim by adhering to conventional standards conducting petrological analysis and providing a historical context, albeit with acknowledged challenges in dating and contextualization. However, this account is not without its flaws. Her belief in the significance of the urban find location lacked any supporting physical evidence. The geological assessment appeared to be problematic, and soon enough events would outpace this dry academic narrative as Anne Ross was pulled deeper into the lore surrounding the heads. During an appearance on the unusual platform of the BBC TV early evening news magazine Nationwide, Anne Ross made astonishing declarations about the Hexham heads that were not suitable for academic circles. She described how her house in Southampton was tormented by a large werewolf that appeared to have trailed the heads all the way from the northeast of England. The heads have been transported south with Ross for examination at her own institution, Southampton University, where she also decided to bring them home. It proved to be a significant misstep. The heads were now accumulating a widespread reputation for being too enigmatic and a distinctly eerie phenomena. Nonetheless, the testing and examination process persisted. The peculiar aspect of this story arises when considering how two specialists, both geologists, reached completely different conclusions about the materials used in these objects. Anne Ross had Professor Hodson from Southampton University examine the objects, and he determined that both heads are made from the same material, a very coarse sandstone with rounded quartz grains from local sources. 
However, a separate analysis by Dr. Douglas Robson of Newcastle University stated that the material from which the heads have been formed is an artificial cement, and the material is unlike any natural sandstone. The initial analysis seemed to rely on microscope work and visual analysis, while the latter involved the invasive removal of a sample for examination. It's puzzling how two analyses of identical objects resulted in such contrasting material identifications. Unfortunately, the sample fragments are no longer available for further testing without causing additional damage to the materials. Archaeologists and geologists extensively examined the heads, extracting samples and engaging in debates over whether they were ancient artifacts or modern creations. With the prevailing opinion leaning towards the latter, Additionally, there were reports of poltergeist activity and a curse linked to the small heads. In 1977, the Hexham heads came under the supervision of Don Robins, a controversial chemist renowned for his book The Secret Language of Stone, which includes references to the heads. Robins explored various earth mysteries, such as the magnetic properties of stones and megaliths, collaborating with Anne Ross on the life and death of a druid prince concerning the Lindau man Bogbody. Intrigued by his stone tape theory, Robins believed the Hexham heads could provide evidence to support it. For more information on the stone tape theory, I have linked in the show notes to a few past episodes in which I have covered it more in depth. After retrieving the heads from a box in Hodson's office at Southampton University, he conducted some analysis but encountered only mild experiences like his car electrics failing and a feeling of being watched by one of the heads. Unable to link the objects to poltergeist activity, Robins then passed them on to Frank Hyde, a dowser. Hyde received the heads in February 1978 for dowsing experiments, and they have remained missing ever since. The spherical objects have gained iconic status for several reasons. All the confirmed events related to the heads occurred during the 1970s, a decade known for its nostalgic, eerie vibe. Consequently, the Hexham heads have evolved into symbolic relics within a community dubbed the Haunted Generation, a spirit that is beautifully portrayed in Bob Fisher's captivating blog and Fortean Times column bearing the same name. These eerie artifacts are reminiscent of folk horrorania mixed with urban weird elements. In essence, the heads have ingrained themselves in a collection of chilling memories for those of a specific age group, alongside the recently resurfaced Usborns the World of the Unknown, Ghosts, and the lingering fondness for unsettling public information commercials warning about the dangers of reckless behavior near hazardous bodies of water or glass-strewn beaches. The story surrounding the heads possesses a visually compelling narrative quality, placing them in the same realm as the BBC Ghost Stories for Christmas, the Children of the Stones, and the Owl Service. The entire saga could easily be imagined as an obscure ITV children's program from 1974, with Ian Cuthbertson playing Don Robins and Gillian Hills as Anne Ross, resembling a tale straight out of an Alan Garner book called The Stones of the Children. The Hexham Heads have transitioned from being featured in books on mysteries and Fortiana to evoking nostalgia for our lost childhood. It raises questions about how much we truly recall about them. The ongoing hunt for the clip of Anne Ross's appearance on the BBC show Nationwide proves elusive for grown adults who believe they remember watching the original broadcast. Still images and transcripts fall short of satisfying this cultural memory, blurring a line between shared recollection and personal reflection. Such is the intriguing blend of power and ambiguity found in material culture, a challenge faced by archaeologists across various settings. Looking ahead, no pun intended, the future of the Hexham Heads seems destined for more podcasts, literature, and continued speculation. While a documentary film titled Heads has been rumored for some time, it remains unreleased thus far at the time of this recording. Perhaps Funko will seize the opportunity to craft collectible figurines inspired by the Hexham Heads as part of their myth range. The quest to locate these artifacts may persist, lingering in the hope that they still linger somewhere, maybe tucked away in a cluttered kitchen drawer alongside miscellaneous odds and ends. The discovery of the rumored cursed nationwide footage could also be on the horizon. Perhaps there is additional potential yet to be explored. 
Perhaps Hexum could consider incorporating the heads and their captivating story into their marketing efforts, capitalizing on the increasing popularity of dark heritage tourism. The few curious visitors who discreetly come to Reed Avenue to take photos of the garden where the heads were discovered might be substituted by larger, more outgoing groups like bus tours and cruise ship day trippers, although it's hard to fathom the residents embracing this change. The Hexham Heads, as many who have delved into their history have observed, are objects that surpass time. The age and legitimacy appear to hold little relevance now, serving as either a clever intellectual maneuver or simply an acknowledgement of the elusive nature of material culture. These items possess a narrative and a distinct process of creation, much like a finely crafted stone axe. They are infused with narratives, myths, assertions, and information, forming a vagueness that continues to obscure any semblance of truth. They embody various identities, totemic symbols, playthings or offerings, conduits of sinister forces attracting supernatural occurrences. They are both rock and concrete, ancient artifacts and products of the 1960s, malevolent and mundane, lost and concealed, ruined and preserved. The possibilities are vast since, like many things we encounter, they are intertwined with our lives, stories, motives, convictions, aspirations, and anxieties. They haunt us due to their fluid nature, their tendency to morph, yet this quality is inherent in most material objects as we imbue them with life through our interactions. The Hexham heads have relied on a spectrum of individuals to give them vitality, in turn enriching the experiences of those who engage with them. This is their enduring influence in essence. The resonance and reach of the Hexham heads surpass most other elements of the urban prehistory pantheon. They truly captivate and linger in the minds of a generation, drawn to eerie and sometimes comical phenomena. One might question if there's a puppet master behind the scenes orchestrating this spectacle for their amusement, pushing boundaries to see just how bizarre things can become. The story of the Hexham Heads carries a soap opera-like intrigue that initially appears scripted. However, the chaotic narrative and inexplicable contradictions surrounding them seem beyond even the wildest imaginations of skilled screenwriters. This tale is so outlandish that it must be true. When Weird Darkness returns, deep within the ancient limestone caves of Wookiee Hole, a legendary witch once cast her dark curse over the nearby village, dooming all love to fail. Centuries later, the echoes of her magic still haunt the caverns, where eerie sounds and ghostly figures continue to baffle and terrify visitors. Is the petrified figure in the witch's kitchen truly the stone remains of the cursed sorceress? Or does her spirit linger, waiting for someone to break the spell? That story is up next. I have not done a live scream in a while, but I have one on the calendar now. On Saturday, September 28th, I'll be streaming live on my YouTube channel, on camera, telling stories, taking your comments and questions, and I'll even be doing a couple of giveaways during the live show. For this live scream, we'll be talking about liminal people and parallel realities. Liminal people, we know them in a variety of forms. Shadow people, black-eyed kids, the sleep paralysis figure of the old hag and more, even demons and angels. They may be non-corporeal, but somehow they can cross into our reality and interact with us. That's the subject of our upcoming live scream on Saturday, September 28th on my YouTube channel and on my website on the live scream page. The stream starts at 5 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can watch the show live and send in your comments on my YouTube channel or just watch it on my website by clicking on live scream at WeirdDarkness.com. We are way past due for a live scream, so this is going to be fun. 
I'm live on camera Saturday, September 28th on the live screen page at WeirdDarkness.com, or you can watch on my YouTube channel where you can also leave comments that I can respond to during the show. Hope to see you Saturday, September 28th. In 1484, Pope Innocent VIII condemned witchcraft as heresy, leading to the persecution of over 200,000 individuals through torture, hanging, and burning across Western Europe over the following three centuries. England has a long-standing connection to witchcraft, evident from the introduction of the first Witchcraft Act in 1542. This association continued through Margaret Murray's 1921 book The Witch Cult in Western Europe. Gerald Gardner's New Forest Coven and the Practice of Wicca. Nestled in Somerset is Wookie Hole, a system of captivating limestone caverns steeped in ancient mysteries. These caves are shrouded in supernatural tales, witchcraft myths, and inexplicable events. Particularly renowned is the story of the Witch of Wookie Hole, believed to inhabit these ancient chambers. The Witch's Kitchen, the initial chamber, features a peculiar stone formation resembling a head peering over the river axe. Legend suggests this is the witch and her dog, turned to stone by Father Bernard's holy water. Visitors have reported seeing diverse faces in the rock depending on the perspective and lighting, sparking curiosity about their origins. An 1839 report mentions a fermenting tub and oven in the witch's kitchen, prompting speculation about the witch's brewing and concocting activities. Intriguingly, the initial recorded incident of strange sounds echoing from the depths of these caverns is traced back to the year 189 AD. Clement of Alexandria, a Roman figure, documented perceiving sounds akin to the clashing of cymbals. Even today, in the third chamber known as the Witch's Parlor, one can still hear these inexplicable reverberations. Subdued, throbbing tones that intensify in volume and foreboding nature before gradually fading away. Herbert Balk, an archaeologist from the early 20th century, not only encountered these unusual sounds firsthand, but also detailed another distinct and unsettling noise in his 1929 publication The Great Cave of Wookie Hole. He described hearing anguished cries and splashes emanating from the river, yet upon further inspection, no evidence of any person could be found. On a separate occasion, with his companion, Captain Kentish, while they were once again in Chamber 2, the Great Hall, a sudden whispering of many voices was audible. Bulk, accustomed to awaiting visitors, paused, expecting guests, but none appeared. Instead, the sounds intensified, escalating into a cacophony that enveloped them. Abruptly, the noise ceased leaving them confounded by what they had just experienced. Another enigmatic feature of these mystical caves is the Witch's Chimney, an ancient water-carved shaft that rises from the cave base toward the surface, towering approximately 100 meters overhead. Etched into its internal walls are what are referred to as Ritual Protection Marks or Witch Marks. Crafted centuries ago, these symbols were believed to ward off malevolent spirits or the evil eye. Many visitors standing in this location describe an abrupt chill, likely caused by a thermal current resulting from body heat. However, for earlier explorers, this chilling sensation undoubtedly heightened the eerie atmosphere of their surroundings. Reports of unexplained fear within the caves have circulated as well. In a 1925 newspaper article, a woman described feeling an intense sense of dread and encountering visions of the devil while visiting. Intriguingly, she later crossed paths with a man who shared a similar chilling experience in those very caves. Moreover, Chamber 4 holds its own enigmas. Both excavations and sporadic floods have revealed human remains here, prompting inquiries into whether these were intentional burials or perhaps ritual sacrifices. The tale of the Wookiee Hole Witch exists in various renditions, yet the core narrative remains consistent. Many years ago, a witch took up residence in the Wookiee Hole Caves near Somerset, 
following a heart-wrenching betrayal by her lover. Driven by anger and grief, she cast a curse on the nearby village of Wookie and its surroundings, damning any romantic endeavors to failure. One particular account tells of a young man from the neighboring Glastonbury who became romantically involved with a girl from Wookie. Their relationship crumbled due to the curse of the Wookie Hole Witch, leaving him devastated. Overwhelmed by heartbreak, he chose to renounce love altogether and embrace a life of solitude as a monk. After enduring the repercussions of the Wookie Hole Witch's curse for years, the people of Wookie sought aid. Appealing to the abbot of Glastonbury, they were assigned a monk, referred to as Father Bernard on occasion, to address the situation. Legend has it that this very monk was the same young man whose love had been thwarted by the witch years earlier. Determined to confront the source of his anguish, the monk ventured into the shadows of Wookie Hole Caves, intent on vanquishing the witch who had cast a dark pall over the land. The Wookie Hole Witch suddenly emerged from her hiding place, launching spells and curses at the monk. However, her efforts were in vain, as each incantation she cast was deflected by the monk's steadfast aura of purity. Legend tells of the monk either blessing the waters of the River Axe or using his own holy water to subdue the witch. Upon contact with the holy water, she was swiftly transformed into stone, withering away into a petrified state. It is said that her petrified form lingers within the initial chamber of the Wookie Hole Caves. These caves, comprised of limestone caverns and functioning as a popular tourist destination, are the focal point of the village of Wookie Hole. The River Axe flows within these caves, designed as a Site of Special Scientific Interest, or SSSI, owing to their significant biological and geological attributes. Furthermore, evidence indicates human utilization of the Wookie Hole Caves dating back over 45,000 years. Discoveries within the caves include tools from the Paleolithic, Neolithic, and Iron Ages, as well as fossilized remains of various animals, such as European badgers, the extinct Pleistocene lion, and the Pleistocene cave hyena. The River Axe's water has been utilized in the papermaking process at the country's oldest paper mill. Within the caves, various cheeses such as cheddar, gruyere, and parmesan are aged due to their consistent temperature of 52 degrees Fahrenheit or 11 degrees Celsius and high moisture levels. Ford Farms from Dorset capitalizes on the cave, known as the Cheese Tunnel, to age their delectable cheddar cheese. The first cave dives in Britain were conducted by divers Graham Bulcombe and Jack Shepard in the Wookie Hole Caves. Since their exploration in 1930, knowledge about the caves has significantly increased. Currently, 25 chambers within the Wookie Hole Caves have been explored, extending about 14,400 feet or 4,400 meters underground at a depth of 300 feet or 90 meters. Linguists and historians have delved into the origins of the name Wookiee Hole, leading to various theories. One theory suggests that the name originates from the Welsh word for cave, ogo, potentially pronounced as ogi. The caves also hold significance with Alfred the Great, a renowned warrior king of the Anglo-Saxons. Interestingly, the Anglo-Saxon word for cave is hole. Combining the Welsh and Anglo-Saxon terms for cave, the name Wookie Hole Caves literally translates to Cave, Cave, Caves. Regarding the witch folklore, physical evidence supporting the legend was discovered in 1912 by Herbert E. Bulk, an English archaeologist, caver, and geologist within the cave system. Scientists examined the skeletal remains found in the Wookie Hole Caves and determined that they'd been there for more than a thousand years. In addition to the bones of the Wookie Hole Witch, remains of a goat, a dagger, and what's been described as a polished stone ball were discovered. The presence of the skeleton and accompanying artifacts has led many to believe in the existence of the Wookiee Hole Witch. Today, the skeletal remains attributed to the Wookiee Hole Witch are on public display at the Wells and Mendip Museum in Wells, Somerset. The discovery of the skeleton at Wookiee Hole Caves is intriguing but raises doubts about the legend of the Wookiee Hole Witch. Scientific analysis conducted on the bones unearthed in 1912 indicated that the majority belonged to a man ages between 25 and 35. One aspect of the legend overlooked at the time of the discovery was the tale of the monk turning the Wookiee Hole Witch to stone. 
If the legend were true, the bones would not belong to her. Interestingly, a form of the Wookiee Hole Witch can be observed in the Wookiee Hole Caves today. It appears as a human-like stalagmite with the silhouette of a witch. While it is unlikely that the Wookiee Hole Witch haunts the caves, there was an audition in 2013 for individuals to portray the role of the witch. Thousands of participants attended the Hex Games audition at the caves. The portrayal of the Wookiee Hole Witch is now part of the tourist attraction in the show cave, especially during school holiday visits by children. Not everyone's convinced that the witch has departed. A team of experts in paranormal phenomena recounts being thoroughly frightened while seeking out the sinister presence of a witch said to inhabit a cave. During an expedition in the caves of Wookiee Hole near Wells, Somerset, paranormal investigator Tony Ferguson and his crew of ghost hunters assert that they heard the malevolent spirit of the witch, who reportedly resided in the caves a millennium ago. Under the guidance of tour leader Jamie Russell, the group entered the caves at night and soon found themselves petrified after supposedly encountering the witch's voice firsthand. Tony described hearing the witch hissing at them and taunting them to approach, seemingly attempting to separate the group of ghost hunters. Furthermore, he claims that they heard the voice menacingly uttering, kill her, with Tony deducing that the witch was disturbed by the female members in the team. Tony, along with his wife Bev and investigators Debbie McCall and Emily Cowell from Ghost to Ghost, maintained that they recited an ancient poem together to rouse the spirit of the sorceress at the exact location where folklore suggests she once resided. It was at this point that they detected a disquieting shift in the atmosphere, accompanied by the eerie sound of a ghostly female voice. The situation escalated to such an extent that even Jamie had to briefly exit the scene. Tony remarked from Southampton, Hampshire, we were being drawn apart from each other. I believe she was attempting to isolate us, but we remained united for reasons of safety. There's a phenomenon known as the drunken feeling, which manifests as a sensation of swaying, indicating the presence of an entity attempting to tap into your energy. Some of us experienced this. Additionally, most of the interactions were auditory, with instances of swearing and hissing, as the entity was aware that we could hear it. The entity communicating with us displayed signs of intelligence. Even Jamie, who's been exploring Wookie Hole for a long time, mentioned that he'd never encountered such clear, audible phenomena during an investigation, Tony said. In addition to hearing voices, the group reported discovering eerie carvings on the cave walls, believed to have been created by the witch herself. Local folklore describes the witch of Wookie Hole as a sorceress from the distant past who used her magic for malevolent purposes resulting in failed crops, livestock deaths, and mysterious disappearances. The villagers considered her dwelling a gateway to hell due to their fear of her powers. Tony, a seasoned paranormal investigator, mentioned that the witch ranks among the most malevolent spirits he has encountered in his 12-year career. He recounted personal experiences with the paranormal, such as seeing a male figure in his grandfather's house during childhood and witnessing a female apparition in his mother's house later on, learning much later that a woman had passed away in the very room where he used to sleep. So it inspired me to seek answers about my childhood experiences. I chronicled this journey by exploring various well-known haunted sites across the UK, noting any peculiar or unexplainable occurrences. Initially, I started documenting these events for personal reflection, yet I was astounded by the extraordinary encounters I've had," he said. A mill has been established at Wookie Hole since the era of the Doomsday Book, transitioning into a paper mill in 1610. The present-day building, originating from the 1850s, underwent expansion in the early 1900s and serves as a representation of the era's industrial revolution. There is a common misconception that caves were utilized as human habitats thousands of years ago. However, in actuality, these subterranean abodes were inhabited merely centuries ago. While not directly linked to Wookie Hole, tales such as that of the infamous Sawney Bean family in Scotland, notorious for their macabre cannibalistic practices in a coastal cave, provoke contemplation about the legacy of cave-dwelling communities. I talk a bit more about Sawney Bean in my episode Book a Stay at a Haunted Airbnb with a story entitled The Man Who Inspired the Hills Have Eyes. I'll link to that in the show notes. With its diverse array of narratives and encounters, Wookie Hole Caves captivate those intrigued by enigmas and the enigmatic. 
one can only ponder what other enigmas do these ancient subterranean passages conceal. As mentioned, a mill has been present at Wookie Hole since the days of the Doomsday Book. Approaching the mill reveals a noisy gathering of rooks and jackdaws chattering high up in the trees, their calls particularly vibrant during the early morning and evening hours. Rooks make themselves comfortable in the trees along the path leading to the caves, while jackdaws occupy the rocky crevices above the river axe as it emerges from the cave. These birds, which hold significance related to the afterlife, death, and rebirth in various societies, add to the air of mystery surrounding the area. The mystique of the rook, with its black plumage symbolizing change and the cycles of life and death, threads stories of spiritual enlightenment into the realm of the afterlife. The presence of these corvids prompts pondering – are they protectors or omens? Could they harbor the souls of those linked to this land, some with tragic connections? The caves behind the mill preserve remnants of ancient human settlement, with archaeological finds of human remains dating back at least two millennia discovered in Chamber 4. Under Wookie Hole, underground passages redirect water from the caves through the village, bringing tales of locals stumbling upon human bones in the river axe and fueling apprehensions and conjectures about the cave's past. During its peak in industry, the mill thrived, housing 200 to 300 workers and being a witness to the diverse stories that they brought with them. Below the mill, the dim, labyrinthine hallways reverberated with the sounds of rushing water, with lingering sightings of a young girl whose tail intertwined with the very brick walls. Historical records of the mill recount narratives of unfortunate accidents, instances of limbs and hair being caught in machinery, amputations, and the tragic water wheel incident of 1892, which might shed light on the identity of the restless, sorrowful figure that frequents the mill's mirror maze. The interconnected fates of the mill and the caves weave a colorful tapestry of the past, murmuring anecdotes of those who once traversed these ancient paths. Stepping through the mill and caves of Wookie Hole transports one back in time, perhaps in the company of spirits from days gone by. When Weird Darkness Returns In 1954, off the coast of Australia, a routine flight turned into one of the most compelling UFO encounters in history. When Royal Australian Navy pilot Lt. O'Farrell reported two mysterious lights outpacing his Sea Fury aircraft, he could not have imagined that his sighting, confirmed by multiple radar operators on the ground, would become a cornerstone case in UFO research for decades to come. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. Be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. Your Bigfoot Expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon, or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. In the mid-1950s, 
a mid-air UFO encounter occurred near Nowra on the southwest coast of Australia in New South Wales. This particular incident is one of the most detailed and intriguing encounters on record and continues to capture the interest of UFO researchers today, all these years later. Notably, an experienced military pilot visually witnessed two anomalous objects, and multiple radar operators also confirmed the presence of these two craft on their radar screens. Furthermore, this encounter is just one of numerous cases involving lone military pilots encountering similar strange disks or round-shaped craft during routine flying missions, both at the time of the sightings and in the years that followed. Remarkably, reports of such sightings have been received from various locations around the world. This account originates from the records of UFO investigator and researcher Bill Chalker, although the journey of his account involved many twists and turns before it came to his attention. The incident initially became public knowledge several months after it occurred, in December 1954, even making its way to the front page of the newspapers. It wasn't until 1982 that the official Australian Navy file concerning the incident was released to Chalker in response to his request for information. However, the most comprehensive understanding of the incident came from Dr. Hynek's notes of an interview conducted with the pilot at the heart of the incident in 1973, which were shared with Chalker in 1984. Coupled with Chalker's own interviews with the witness, a detailed picture of the incident finally emerged. At 7.10 p.m. on the evening of August 31, 1954, Lieutenant J. A. O'Farrell was returning to Royal Australian Navy Air Station Nowra in his Sea Fury aircraft. While in flight, he suddenly noticed an unusual bright light moving directly across his path. The light then positioned itself to his left side. Another light appeared at his 9 o'clock position, moved in front of his aircraft and settled at the 1 o'clock position. O'Farrell described these glowing objects as the fastest he had ever witnessed. Upon contacting the control tower, O'Farrell was informed that the radar also detected the two objects near his aircraft. The radar operator confirmed the proximity of the objects and inquired about O'Farrell's visual confirmation. O'Farrell reported seeing a vague shape with a white light on top. In a later interview with Dr. Hynek, O'Farrell recounted the detailed encounter. O'Farrell remembered being the central aircraft on the radar screens as the aircrafts approached too closely for safety. Despite seeing the black mass of the object's exteriors, he could not discern specific details. They lingered beside him for a few minutes, which were observed by the radar operators in the control tower. Suddenly, and without warning, each of them streaked away to the northeast at high velocity. Simultaneously, the radar operators verified that the objects were vanishing from their screens. Both O'Farrell and the radar operators tried to monitor the two objects for several minutes to no avail. Upon landing his aircraft at 7.30 p.m., the entirety of the encounter likely spanned between 10 to 15 minutes. Upon disembarking from his plane, a crowd had gathered near the runway keen to converse with him. Among those who approached him soon after he exited his aircraft was the surgeon commander. He promptly began scrutinizing and examining O'Farrell, inquiring about any feelings of sickness or uneasiness, as well as his emotional state. After some time, he seemed content that the pilot was unaffected by any negative repercussions from the encounter though he offered O'Farrell the opportunity to visit the medical bay later that evening for a more thorough assessment, an offer which O'Farrell accepted, passing all evaluations without issue. In a subsequent interview with Bill Chalker years later, O'Farrell recounted Dr. Hynek's fascination with the case. Hynek had allegedly mentioned studying thousands of sightings worldwide and had found O'Farrell's sighting to be one of approximately 15 that remained inexplicable. Of note to O'Farrell was that all of these mysterious cases involved individuals with aviation backgrounds or experience. Hynek did not place excessive importance on the case. Instead, O'Farrell perceived it as aligning with the interests of those in higher positions who sought to impress the UFO investigator. Despite the absence of a defense threat, the files remained open possibly due to this dynamic. O'Farrell suggested to Chalker that such files were typically archived or discarded Yet in this instance, neither action occurred. The file persisted without challenge or clarification. 
Years later, the new chief defense scientist, John Ferens, who had always been fascinated by the case, actively engaged with it upon assuming his new role. Through discussions with O'Farrell, Ferens concluded that the pilot's sighting was indeed authentic and significant. Subsequently, it was revealed that additional visual sightings of the objects had been seemingly disregarded at the time. During the incident, the radar at Narolan was offline and a technician repairing it observed two mysterious lights passing overhead. Similarly, an air traffic controller at Mascot reported sighting two strange lights approaching around the same time as O'Farrell's encounter. Despite his openness about the incident in the ensuing decades, O'Farrell initially expressed a desire to keep things quiet when Ferens sought to revisit the case. He admitted feeling foolish about the investigation and worried that it could harm his career in the long run. This perspective is intriguing. Despite the supporting radar and visual evidence, O'Farrell was concerned about potential ridicule and career setbacks, even though he was certain of the reality of what he had witnessed. One can only speculate about how others, especially lone witnesses, might refrain from reporting their own encounters for similar reasons. The true nature and origin of the objects, as well as their intentions that evening in southwestern Australia, remain a mystery. O'Farrell's sighting likely happened, especially considering Dr. Hynek's inability to provide a satisfactory explanation. It is interesting to note that there were several comparable sightings in the late 1940s and 1950s involving solitary military pilots who witnessed objects materialize unexpectedly and approach their aircraft. Once again, we have to ponder whether the mysterious crafts were actually assessing the military capabilities of the world during that era. If so, it begs the question, what was the purpose behind such evaluations? Could it be that humanity, particularly its military forces, was under scrutiny by extraterrestrial intelligences from beyond our world? If this speculation holds true, to what extent were various governments and intelligence agencies worldwide aware of this? The Sea Fury incident, while seemingly a small piece of the larger UFO and alien phenomena, remains a significant point of interest for UFO researchers today. Just like numerous similar cases from the 1950s and beyond, what were the intentions behind these encounters, and is there a possibility of such occurrences recurring in the future? Concluding with the notable words of Bill Chalker, whose thorough research and investigation have been instrumental in our understanding of the incident, it's worth noting that the Sea Fury encounter is recognized as one of the most compelling unexplained radar visual UFO incidents on record in Australia, and potentially even worldwide. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. While on the site, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 21 verse 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. And a final thought, everyone may be entitled to his own opinion, but everyone is not entitled to his own truth. Truth is but one. Doug Gruthius. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.